It is our pleasure to have the first in a series that we hope will continue for a while. Uh, it's the Border to Border series. It was conceived as an exploration of um, issues that impact people around the world, as you likely have heard maybe even too much already. Certainly an issue that will impact the uh, elections in the United States, but it is by no means the only place that is impacted by border um, matters around the world. Being the Center for Latin American Studies, I am uh, Manuel Roman Lacayo, I'm the Associate Director. Uh, our hemisphere is also experiencing all sorts of impacts from uh, migration, some of it forced uh, throughout, and some of the effects of that we see here in the United States but as I said, by no means the only place. We are very fortunate to have with us Federico Rios, who is a uh, renowned uh, and acclaimed photojournalist who's worked in any number of media outlets that uh, whose work has been published. Um, of course, New York Times. Today, if you saw an article on this topic, his photos accompany that work. He's actually done a lot of this. And uh, of course, also very fortunate to have Dr. Scott Morgenstern, Professor of uh, Political Science, who will be the moderator for this event. So without further ado, and not wanting to take any more time, uh, for the students, please make sure to uh, use the QR codes for your suitable um, uh, connection. There's one in the entrance as well, and we'll leave it to Scott. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. <laughs> um, thanks very much. Um, I think everybody's uh, here for um, for a treat. Um, got to meet um, Federico last night and just some wonderful stories to tell. Um, he's really an amazing reporter uh, and photographer who has, whose work we've all seen for, for years in the New York Times. And what's great about it is that he's been bringing the, the crisis of, of the humanity of the crisis to life for all of us that have been reading his and seeing his picture. Um, um, I also want to call out Luis Amanda Hank, who's here somewhere, I think, out in the back hiding, who is the organizer and really took the initiative to set this up and really deserves a lot of credit. So thank you all. I well, we want to thank her for setting this this, speak, this talk up and the rest of the series that's, that's going to be coming forward. Um, um, at the outset, let me say that I'm very much looking forward to this, um, to what's going to be a much more promising or interesting talk than the other two people who are talking about the crisis uh, at the border today. That is our two presidential candidates who are at the border. Um, so this is a very topical, timely day for him to talk. And I'm sure this is going to be much more interesting than what they're going to have to say. Um, contributing to the timeliness of Federico's work in our discussion today, um, as Manuel said, I want to point out the article in Taurus that came out in the New York Times today. And there's another one I know coming out tomorrow. Uh, and the one today, he continues to explore the amazing journeys of, of the migrants through the Darien Gap, um, but also discusses the political tussle between the U.S. and the countries in Latin America, as well as the role of the unscrupulous human traffickers who are exploiting and profiting from these desperate migrants. The immigration crisis, which is now a word uh, with contested political implications, by the way, is complex, and we can and should discuss the push factors, the economics, politics, and violence that are leading to the desire of migrants to leave their countries, not to mention the U.S. role uh, in creating those crises. We could also delve into the U.S. politics of immigration, asking why our government cannot figure out a humane response, even after decades of pressure, and why so much of the rhetoric ignores the humanity of the crisis. We could also discuss the different concerns that begin when migrants arrive at the border itself, and then transition into the complex web of concerns. Um, related to the millions of migrants who have crossed the border over the last many decades. This would include paths towards citizenship, the rights of children, including the dreamers, schooling, housing, health care, drivers, driver's licenses, work authorization, not to mention the politics of the border, cities, and other, and other cities. Today, however, I presume that Federico is going to focus on the human side. Um, given that he has recently finished his third harrowing trip through the Darien Gap, in order to document what people are willing to do in order to get what they to where they think will be or will hope to be will be the promised land. As we've all seen over the years, if not decades, 
The allures of the United States, whether those of us who live here can fully appreciate them, um, have pulled hundreds of thousands of migrants north. The stories of their journeys are unimaginable to most of us, and Federico and his colleagues helped bring their stories to life. In one recent article about a trip to the Daring Gap, part of the story focused on small acts of kindness, and Federico captured this in amazing pictures. The first photo was a man who was helping a young girl who had lost her mother. Um, she's trying to get through the underbrush and through the mud. He's helping her through. Um, another is of a fellow traveler who's helping this woman um, with a, an injured leg. And they're sitting there, of course, with no medical equipment and in the mud, and he's trying to help her. Um, there's a third story of this incredibly exhausted couple, again, sitting in the mud, which seems to be a theme. Um, and they look incredibly exhausted, and their toddler is sitting on their, on their lap. It's just amazing to bring the humanity into what these people are going through to get here. Even beyond his recent work on the Darien, about which he'll talk today, at least I think that's what he's going to talk about, um, Federico has had a fascinating career. Um, he recently published a book called Verde, about 10 years he spent with the FARC uh, in the jungles of Colombia. Um, he was then mistaken for someone else and had to leave, leave the country for some time. Um, we know about the violence against journalists uh, in Colombia. He's also published articles about other aspects of Latin American countries. One highlights a new national park in Colombia, which is a fascinating story. Another is about the violence in Ecuador. He's also been um, on a number of trips to Haiti. Um, there's an extended story uh, that's, that I didn't realize was his until I looked back again this morning that I read a long time ago um, that's called Reparations to the Enslavers. It's an amazing story of, the sad, of, of that sad country. And another uh, that he told us about and when he took he went to Haiti just after the assassination of their president last night. So again, I'm very much looking forward to this. I think this is a great treat for us. Uh, so with that, I just want to welcome you here and thank you very much for, for being with us. Thank you. Thank you, Scott, and thank you, Manuel, and of course, thank you, Rosamanda, for thinking about bringing me here. And it's been a really pleasure to talk to this group of people. I'm Federico, I'm a photographer from Colombia. Uh, I hope you can understand my broken English. If I miss some words, I'm sure Rosamanda and Miguel can help me. Um, I start focusing on migration in 2014 15 when the economic collapse of Venezuela forced Venezuelans to start walking into Colombia. And the first, one of the first things I learned when I started documenting Venezuelans walking into Colombia was that I was not talking about migration at large, but something very specific. I was talking about poor people migrating. And I want to make that point clear because I'm not going to talk today about Venezuelans going to Colombia or Venezuelans going to South America but Venezuelans crossing the Darien Gap, trying to come to the United States. But the people who have to do that journey is the poor people. It's not the middle class. It's not the upper class. They can buy plane tickets. They can apply to asylum. They can go to other places. So I think it's very important to point that these are poor people from Venezuela. And what is the Darien Gap? Um, so, this is Colombia. It's the border. It's the Pacific. And in the border between Colombia and Panama, there's a hill. That's the Darien Gap. Again, this is Panama. This is Colombia. And this is Darien Gap. So it's easy. You need to start walking here. Go to the top of the mountain, come down, and you're done. <laughs> yeah? Again, Colombia, Panama, Darien. In 2021, when I started following this journey, to make it from here, point A, to here, point B, can take up to nine days of walking in the jungle. Nowadays, people can achieve the same trek in two or three days. People have not become uh, stronger and faster for years, but the routes change a lot. 
Mm. There's a place here called Nekokli. It's a small beach town, a very small beach town. And all the migrants crossing the Darien Gap have to make it here. They go to different cities, they go different ways. There are several ways to make it here. And from here, they have to cross by boat. Two or three hours by boat. This is called the, this is called the Urava Gold. But all the migrants have to do that. Mm. Let me share the screen now. After crossing the ocean in a boat, they arrived at this kind of place. This is called Akandi. And um, huh. okay. okay. In 2021, uh, I was in Haiti after they killed President Jovenel Moïse. They like we don't know yet who killed the president. And suddenly, people from Haiti, who was living in Chile and Brazil, start moving now. But numbers of the situation were kind of weird. Uh, from year 2000 to year 2020, it was 10,000 people a year crossing the Darien Gap. In 2021, sorry, 100, yeah, 150,000 people across the dying gap. So the increasing from 10,000 to 150,000 from one year to the next was crazy. In 2022, it was almost double the size, and 2023 was. Again, double size. For 2024, it's a question, but I'm expecting a little a million people. How does how this reflect on the border of the states? In 2023, it was two and a half million people crossing the border. That means the fifth part was people crossing from the Darien, but not all the people is coming from there. So. Some people is flying to Central America, to Nicaragua, and maybe other countries, and starting the journey from there. And also some other people is coming from Central America. Mm. Oh, yes. This was, in 2021, yeah. the first camp, which was basically Haitians who were living in Chile and Brazil, and they were coming up north crossing all Latin America by bus, and then facing the Daringa. Just a few, a few people, not very organized. Uh, it was very chaotic. Uh, and it was, at that time, extremely dangerous. It's dangerous even now, but it was more dangerous then. And as you can see in the pictures, most of the people were from Haiti. So these 150,000 people were mostly Haitians. Mm. And it's extreme. This is like a, a place for extreme athletes, but people without any kind of sports training and any kind of equipment is there to do it. This is a patient woman crossing with the husband, a little girl, and a baby hanging from its front. And this is a place called Bajo Chiquito. This is in Panama. So people start here in Necocli. They cross the ocean and they start walking the mountains. They come down. But there are two main uh, paths for migrants in Daringa. This is where one of these paths ends.
with my mouse. Okay. I'm trying to hide the bar inside. Can you, can you help me? Yes. You lost your mouse. Yeah, I lost my mouse. <laughs> It's yeah. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, that there has to be some technology. <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's better like this. I don't know, but I hide it, but you can see it there. People exit from that road and they were driving by indigenous communities in small boats like this to other indigenous communities. And at the end, to camps designed by the Panamanian government uh, in an alliance with NGOs to help the people. You know, people were starving, malnourished, uh, with tropical diseases. Really, they, they were arriving in really bad conditions. This, again, is Necocli. This is a starting point. And this was Necocli in 2022. No, in 2021. Um, and I'm going to jump in time to last week. What happened? The people that drive, the migrants, from here to here are official boat companies. But these boat companies work together or work under the law, criminal groups that control the area. That, and this is very important to understand. All this area is not controlled by Colombian government or Panamanian government. They have no control on the, on the area. So last week, um, the Colombian government captured two boat captains doing this route with migrants. Two. Those are the first captures of people driving migrants on the sea in three years. What happened? The illegal group that control the region get pretty mad. And they said, okay, so there's no migrants moving on the area, which is basically what the states want, what Panama wants, and what Colombia wants. In four days, there were 10,000 people here. And they call the government and say, okay, you came here and fixed the situation because if you're not going to allow the criminal group to control the, the area, then, okay, let me see how you do. And the government says, no, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> and keep doing your business. And they are going back to business, hopefully, tomorrow. And the people is going to keep migrating. So uh, my perspective of covering migration from the journalistic side has also a deep commitment with covering migration from, um, from a humanitarian side. That's why I started telling you that this is not people who have a middle-class life back in Latin America in their home cities. This might be people who have studies. They are doctors, lawyers, engineers, people who have works. But one important thing to notice or to point is how hard is life down there. Down there, I mean, in the global south. Because also we're seeing people from Africa doing the same route. Mm. So people start getting around Necocli, families with babies, families with toddlers, <clears throat> begging for money in the streets. And in three years, you saw the first pictures. Now, this is how the Darien Gap looks like. Like a highway. This used to be a Princeton jungle back in 2020. I mean, four years ago, it was Princeton jungle. Jaguars were walking, walking all over the place. There's a video on TikTok. A migrant is walking, like doing a selfie, like a selfie video, and suddenly he moves the cell phone, and it's a jaguar walking behind him. And this is the journey. This is how people walk with the backpacks. And each person on this photo, each migrant on the Daring Gap, 
has a backpack with all his belongings. All his belongings. Have you think about leaving your house, packing a backpack, and deciding, what am I going to put in? What am I going to bring for my new life? What are going to be my, my memories? Just the backpack. This is Luis Miguel and her daughter, Melissa. Luis Miguel was 28. Uh, when I took this picture, that was 2022. 20, and Melissa was five. Uh, this was the second day of journey. And you can see by his boots, by his legs, how, how deep was the mud. You know, it's, it's complex because when you're, when you're that deep, you need to grab your leg with your, both your hands and pull it out. So every step, every step takes a lot of energy and, of course, a lot of time. And this was only the second day of a nine days journey. And he was exhausted at his limit, at, at the limit of his energy, physically and mentally. He sat down there. He vomited twice. And the daughter was just looking at his father, looking at his hero, devastated. This was coming down from that place. You see the guy wearing a blue, blue long sleeve shirt and red trousers, grabbing the girl by his hand in the center of the picture. Mm, that guy was a musician, trombone player. His name was is uh, Gabriel Infante. Gabriel Inf Infante was a trombone player, and the girl he's holding is not his daughter. He, he was single and he has no family. But while crossing the jungle, Gabriel found this family struggling with this daughter and a baby. So he says, come on, let me help you. One thing, one thing important uh, that's happening in the jungle is like everybody tries to be uh, helpful for the other people. Like you, you don't see um, people walking just by themselves. In the mornings, every morning, you see uh, how people get together, like in the starting point, and it looks like a race, like when, when you're going to start a race. And the first five minutes, you immediately notice young, healthy, athletic, single men in front and families. And three hours later, they get together again, because the ones in the front realize that the ones in the back need a hand and they start coming back. So this guy walked all his way, carrying his trombone in the back and singing uh, Rondas Infantiles, how do you say that? Mm -hmm. Children's, Children's songs. Children's songs. This six years old young woman who was like taking out from reality, you know? She was crying because of the mud, because of the uh, weather. It's like it's, the jungle is really complex. And once Gabriel starts singing the songs, she was unplugged from that reality and she started answering his songs. And she was like walking, singing mantras that kept her alive during crossing the jungle. This woman was walking uh, next to us. She felt it sounds like really bad. It sounds like a crack. I took the photo and I ran. Uh, there was a lot of people that passed around to, to see if there was something happening. And she was able to walk. It looks like she has nothing. The next morning, the next morning she wakes up and told us she was bleeding. and She had lost a baby. We didn't know she was pregnant. Uh, can I turn off the lights? Would be too dark. Yep. Maybe it's very Much better. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Most of the Venezuelan migrants are not choosing the diving gap as their first choice. Most of them are trying to do something different with their life. Several of them have tried to go to Colombia, Ecuador, Bolivia, Peru, and other countries in Latin America. Brazil is not 
uh, country they, they choose easily because of the language. But the rest of the Spanish language countries, they, they try for that. There's a lot of Venezuelans in Colombia and many other South American countries doing this, delivering food. Because you can go there, next day you have a job. But the payment is so low that they can't make it to the end of the month. They can feed their family. They can't even feed themselves from there. But when I, when I found this guy in the jungle walking with that fast food uh, backpack, it was, it was an interesting metaphor for me. I thought, okay, this guy tries. He tries in Colombia. It's impossible. And this is Jordi Chino kissing a two month baby in the jungle. And of course, the easy, the easy way to think about this is who thinks about bringing a two month baby into the jungle? You can easily die. But I bet you the family of that baby is thinking the same. Right? For migrants, there are two choices. Risking their family in the jungle or crossing the jungle, leaving their families behind and never see them again. Because one thing about migrants is if they came and they, they made it, they can't go back. All these people in the pictures, even the ones find a job and a working permit, they can't just take a plane and fly back. Even if they have the money, they just can't. All jungle is full of that. Uh, it's really hard to say how people die and how many people have been dying. These numbers I'm showing you are Panamanian numbers. Because this is the number of people who made it to Panama. We don't have the number of people living below. And as we don't have two numbers to compare, we don't know how many people have been dying in the jungle. These are families. And it's bittersweet. But I can tell you that most of these families on my pictures I keep in touch with them, and most of them are living in the States, living their dream, and having what means for them, at least, a successful life. This is Gabriel Infante again. And every morning, he was playing the Venezuelan anthem on his trombone. And people around were smiling, you know? Even in these hardship conditions, you know? Like, can you see? His food are swallowed. The woman's in the back. Everything's full of trash. And everybody was waking up, starving, but with a smile, trying to share a coffee. I have seen people like with one glass of coffee, like half of this size. One sip, and then the next one, and the next one, and the next one. One glass for 10 people. This is an indigenous community in the Panamanian side. These are Kuna indigenous. And this is a complex, very complex situation. The Kuna people and the people who control migration, whoever they are, control the routes where migrants are going through. So most of the migrant routes goes close to indigenous communities. And the indigenous are profiting from migration. $10 for a meal, $5 for a bottle of water or soda, $2 for sleeping under a roof, $20 for a canoe ride. These people were held behind the fence, not to use kidnap, but held behind the fence, and they had to pay $10 each <clears throat> to leave the camp. And that was the only option. You had to pay the indigenous ten dollars in order to leave the camp. And if you don't have ten dollars, then you have to give away your watch or your cell phone or a pair of shoes. And if not, you have to stay there and work for as long as the indigenous people think it's fair, and they will let you go. This woman was 
really sick. She was she was having fever and vomiting and had diarrhea, and she was not able to stand up and move. And there was nothing to do with weight. And this is all the friends who were crossing the jungle with her, and they were just just waiting because there's nothing else to do. The guy with the best is a guy. Sometimes groups of migrants pay guides, and a family paid to this guy to carry the baby to the top of the hill. And I walk with him, photographing him and photographing all the migrants. And suddenly we were on top of the mountain, and this guy was screaming to try to find the parents of this baby. And he screamed for one hour. And after one hour, the parents appeared. But he was telling me that many times people give away the kids, the babies, and never show up again. This was a Venezuelan guy walking with only one leg, and his brother behind him carrying the luggage for a boat. And this was Angel and Sara. I was standing on top of a hill, and I saw these, these trees and people having like a hard time to cross the trees. And when I saw the guy, <clears throat> I noticed something strange in the way she, in the way he was handling the girl. I I asked him, like, is that your daughter? Because it doesn't look for me that she was the daughter. I had two kids, maybe the same age. And the way he handled my kids is different, you know? Like, if they are strangers, you have one way, but if they are your kids, like, quite different. And I told him, it's like, is, is that your daughter? And he said, no. And then I asked him, okay, so, was her family. She has tears on her eyes. And he said, I don't know. His name is Angel. Mm. We start talking. And that morning, Angel was walking with two of his friends. Again, three young, strong guys. You can see his muscles. And there was a woman with this daughter, and the woman asked him for some help. Like, can, you, can you help? And be, yes, of course, man. And Angel puts Sara in his shoulders and starts walking. <clears throat> Once in a while, he was looking back, and the mother was walking behind. And suddenly he turned back, and there was nobody. So he says, OK, I'm going to slow down, wait a little bit, and maybe she'll catch up later. It was slow, slow, so going slow, looking back, and nothing. Later that day, Angel asked uh, my colleague Julie and me if, if they can put their tent next to our tent. And I said, yes. We said the tents, the mother never appeared. The next day, the guy started the journey, the mother never appeared. And the next day, they walked the jungle again to the end of the jungle, and the mother didn't appear. And the fourth day, the mother reached him. She had blisters on her foot. She had to walk really slowly because every foot, every step hurt her so much that, she, that it was really, really complex to walk. Just to understand how complex is human nature, Alexandra the mother of Sara, was blaming Angel for taking care of her daughter. And she was saying, this guy was trying to kidnap her daughter. I don't blame her. She asked for help and the other guy started walking with the daughter. Uh, but I was lucky to be there and to witness how this guy was taking care of unknown children. He left Andres his own son, back in Colombia with his brother. And his son was the same age as Sarah. And maybe that's why he kept that like fatherly spirit for this young woman.
This is Hamlet family. Uh, yeah, three siblings. The mother died in Venezuela because of breast cancer. There was no treatment. She died. After she died, they moved to Peru. And the father was collecting trash in the streets of Peru, and he was not making enough money to feed the whole family. And just two of them were going to school because he was not able to pay for three of them. School uh, in that place was free. And one day, the, the one who's crying, which is the, the oldest one of the three of them, she came back from school with this idea. Father, I just saw on social media people crossing the Danube going to the States. Why don't we go? And the father says, you know what? Sounds like a good plan. Let's go. They went there. This is the father. We follow him for four days. He ate nothing. We were just drinking water from the river. Because the few food he had, he was saving it for his daughters. Here he was basically unable to move. He was exhausted at the media of exhaustion. He was not able to move or talk. This is the other condition of Darien. If you're walking in the jungle, you got two choices. Sun that is burning you and dehydrating you, or rain. This guy is walking barefoot on stones and carrying a child. And then this is one of the most dangerous scenarios in Darienga. When people start crossing the rivers, you don't expect the migrants to be, to be expert on weather or wildlife. So you start crossing the river, but if, it's there, if, if there's rain in, up in the mountains, then the river grows and grows really fast. So the problem is, the river grows in seconds. You start crossing, and if you notice a different coloration in the, in the water, because it's like green, you notice it's like uh, brown, that means it's going to grow. It takes like 10 seconds to go from there to two meters high. So basically, there's a lot of people who have died there, drowned, because the river grows and they don't know it's when. This is something they do. You can notice the water is brown here. So it's really high and really fast. So people who make like human chains across. This is also another family. And the boy in front got lost one hour before arriving to the end. Uh, they were walking and they just stopped seeing their, their son. And they thought the son was in front of them. They start walking faster. They arrived to the, to the indigenous town and start looking for the son. The son was not there. The son appears four hours later crying. He was lost alone in the jungle, 10 years old boy. And these are the camps I was talking to you in, in Panama. This is after crossing the Gulf, after crossing the mountains, located in Panama. When you exit there, you find camps like this with Panamanian police and NGOs, or food program, UNICEF, United Nations, IAS, uh, International Red Cross, everything. But then you realize you're not free. You're behind bars, and there's only one way to get out of it, paying $60 and being passed from the south of Panama to the north, the border with Costa Rica. Basically, all the countries in, Latin, in South America are doing the same. Of course, once people came out of the jungle, they tried to call their families, they tried to call their relatives, and tell them they are, they are okay, they, they survived the jungle, and of course, asking for money to continue the journey.
This is a different story, but the same story. In 2020, the American government decided to withdraw their troops from Afghanistan. They agreed a truce with the Taliban, and after the truce, and after the withdrawal of the troops, the idea was that Afghanistan was going to have democratic government. It took out the American army, and the democracy, democracy never came to Afghanistan. Taliban went to power and started killing everybody who was not part of the Taliban. The problem was not just the killings. The problem was that you need to be aligned with the Taliban. But if you have work for foreigners, if you speak a foreign language, if you have any kind of tie, if you were a translator, a driver, a fixer, cooker, whatever, you were a target for Taliban. And if you were a woman, that was even much worse. And if you were a father of a family with women, also worse. Women are not allowed to go to the streets by themselves. They are not allowed to touch money. They can't go buy groceries by themselves. They don't decide who to get uh, as a boyfriend, or they can't decide who to get married, or even they can't decide if they want to get married or not. So many Afghans start leaving the country, trying to survive the Taliban, most of them to Iran, but Iran is also a Muslim radical country, and they're trying to flee somewhere else. So really soon they understand and they learn Brazil was offering them a humanitarian visa. So they decide to go to Brazil. They fly to Iran, some of them to Turkey or Qatar, and from there, cross the ocean and go to Brazil. And if you go to Brazil, even nowadays, if you land in Brazil, the airport called the airport in Sao Paulo is called Guarulhos. In the second floor, you're going to find a camp full of Afghan people. These people live there for one or two months while they collect enough money to keep the journey up. Brazil is making efforts to try to teach Portuguese and try to help Afghans to understand Brazilian culture. But the gap is quite big. And Brazil is in the South, and many countries in the South, it's really complex to understand the culture, and it's really hard to make enough money to make a living. And these people is not trying to make, not just trying to make a living, but it's trying to make a living and send some money back. So that's almost impossible. One of the problems I face as a photographer, or one of the situations I face as a photographer trying to photograph these people, was Afghans telling me, if you photograph my face, the Taliban is going to see my face in the New York Times. If they see my face in the New York Times, they are going to kill all my family in revenge. And I have to find a way to photograph some people without faces. Yeah. Like this couple. <laughs> this woman, she is from an ethnic minority called Asara. And the Asaras are also uh, serious. No, persecuted. Casados, persecuted. Prosecuted by the Taliban. <laughs> and then going back to the Darien Gap, I found people from China. This guy was a Christian, Chinese Christian. Family was very poor, and her mother gave, her, gave him this suit. As a, as a gift. And that was the only clothes he was bringing to cross there again. And this is the line of Chinese Christians fleeing China. So every group finds their own route. The Chinese fly from China to Europe, and from Europe they can fly to Ecuador, because somehow Ecuador doesn't require a visa if you are from China. 
from Ecuador, they go by bus to Colombia. It's a very long journey. They made it here, and then the diary began. It was a Haken boy who was born in Chile. And these were the Chinese people trying to board the boats, the crappy boat. These are the boats crossing this place. Two weeks ago, one of these boats sank. Nine people died. Cargans crossing the jungle, crossing the Darien Gap, because they go to Brazil and from there they cross all the jungle, Peru, Ecuador, and Colombia. Babies. This was a very old man from Afghanistan. He had to stop every 15, 20 minutes and have massages. And he has all his family, 40, 14 sons, doing messages, his legs and his back, trying to keep him hydrated and giving him food and crackers. He was a former police officer in Afghanistan. This guy was exhausted. This was a family. He was working as a translator for, for the World Food Program. And his wife, in the back, who were in purple, she was a uh, human rights activist in Afghanistan, trying to fight for women's rights. Of course, she was part of the government. But once the Taliban went into the government, her name was one of the first names we prosecuted. This is how some people who is like halfway prepared do the food in jungle. And this was a 13 years old girl in the jungle vomiting in very bad condition. That was his father behind her. Taiba, the woman I was talking to, her son and all Afghans while crossing, and this is the jungle. One of the things these people said to me is that most of them have never seen the ocean, and of course they have never seen rainforest. They have never seen so much green. They were now scared to death of all these situations. This is the these are the boats that drive migrants from the day start to the ending point. This is a short series of Afghans with the belongings they bring to cross the jungle. A picture of his um, niece, not niece, um, nephew, and boyfriend back in Afghanistan. The guy has a Quran. A picture of his daughter, uh, wife. And this is an artifact they used to pray. This is a very smart young woman who had a dictionary. She learned five languages by herself. Cell phone, of course. When I asked this woman for the most loved uh, belonging she crossed the young with, she found the door. This is part of the Quran, part of water, and a flower. This was the same old guy praying after I skimmed the jungle. And after crossing the Darien Gap, all these migrants have to face the rest of Central America. Because it's not that you cross the Darien Gap, it's complex, and then you made it. You have all Central America. So Panama is a bus, Costa Rica is a bus, Guatemala halfway is a bus, but north of Guatemala and old Mexico are really complex places for these people. This is Mojgan, an African girl, the only who speaks English, and her family, there was a family of nine people, and she was the only English speaker. They had to wait about three weeks stuck in Mexico City because Mexico demand for a special permit 
to keep traveling from Mexico City up north. Otherwise, if the Mexican authorities capture you, they send you to the border in the south. It's all illegal. But that's what they do. This is their family, stuck in a cheap hotel, single room. What you can find here is Venezuelans, Haitians, and Afghans waiting for the permit. This is the same family you have seen in the jungle, now traveling north. It's two days in a bus without stopping. There's a one bus bathroom for, for 35 people that does not stop for food or bathroom. And that's the border in Tijuana, the North Pacific. And this is the migration authorities patrolling the border and people trying to cross fence. And ironically, when people cross the fence, do you know what they do? Okay, so this, this is the fence. All these people are migrants from Afghanistan. They cross the fence and they sat down and wait for the authorities to come. That's it. That's all. And then the authorities came and they turned themselves in and claimed for asylum. There's no need to the war. There's no need for the war. That's how they cross the wall. Several people have broken their legs trying to do that. But it's it is senseless. So with all these photo series, I'm trying to go back and forward. This is again Nicopri. This is the starting point again. So I have to go and come back many times just to see how the situation is evolving. Like people who are dealing with migrants is becoming um, wealthy, rich, pretty fast. Uh, buses like these, at least a hundred of buses like this, arriving to this town every day. You know, kids like this dreaming on an American dream almost every single day. Families living in the beach trying to collect enough money to go north, making hammocks with blankets. Do you see the stamps on the passports? Okay, so the illegal group controlling the area has developed uh, strategies to control who goes and who doesn't go. And also they have been developing strategies to collect the money. But that stamp is $80. If you don't have the stamp, you can't cross. And the same group is doing this, which is kind of uh, nonsense. Um, the group is investing the money from migration on improving infrastructure in beach towns, abandoned by Colombian government for decades. And the interesting thing is this woman here, she is Julie Torkiewicz, she's my colleague. She's the writer mm -hmm. I work with, and we go as a team every time to document, like to write and document migration. This is the daily scene at the beach towns, migrants going and coming every single day. And this is how the group tells migrants how much it is, how long is it going to be. It's crazy. This was an 18 years old woman with two daughters traveling just by themselves. I think this woman was the few ones I have met that didn't make it. I learned that she was kidnapped by a group and she didn't have enough money to pay to go to release. After that, I never heard back again from her. And these are uh, bracelets the group use to control who can go because you need to pay for the stamp on your passport and then you need to pay for these two bracelets for security. Samuel, 11 years old. And this is what a woman was trying to pack. What you see behind are clothes and then it's food, the rest of the journey. 
this is the group controlling that nobody brings weapons, knife, machetes, anything. And this is how morning in the beginning of the diving gap looks like. This is September last year. There's more than 2,000 people every day. Neoplea? Sorry? This is in Neoplea? No. When you cross Neoplea, here is a candy. This, when you start walking, is from here. It's just like that. Just like an exodus. Just like a biblical image. People trying to go somewhere else. This is Samuel again. A woman with his cat. She made it with the cat to the States. <laughs> and in one turn of the river, there was this guy selling in bananas. So I thought it was useful to understand how everybody is profiting from migrants who are people in really hard conditions and extreme poverty. And this guy was using that the people were starving <laughs> in the town of the river selling in bananas, bananas and bananas, and it was two dollars each one, which well, I, would, I would easily pay two dollars for an empanada here in Pittsburgh, you know, but not in the river. And he was saying, yeah, you can, you can try it. You don't like it, you don't pay it. But everyone was paying that. And this guy was selling ice creams and making empanadas, selling empanadas or ice creams. These people were making more than $200 a day. Minimum wage in Colombia is $250 a month. Mother exhausted. We have two sons. Ten dollars for sleeping in a hammock instead of sleeping in the floor. And this was the next day. People praying to continue their journey. And this was traffic in the jungle because in some places the path is so thin or so uh, steep. steep that people have to wait for other people to go. This is exactly the border. And I have realized through, through the years following these caravans of migrants, that they don't have a sense of geography. They don't have an idea of how long that's going to take. Uh, they don't know after like they're in Colombia, they think, okay, I'm going to cross that gap and then I'm in the States, that's it. So they were celebrating, they were really happy because when they saw the border, it's like, okay, from now it's downhill and then I'll be in the States. They don't know how long it's from there. This is a drone shot to try to explain how, how complex is the jungle. Mm. I don't know if, you, if you're familiar with uh, Werner Herzog, a uh, German movie maker. Um, he's, a, he's a film director. And uh, Werner has to have worked uh, most of his life in the Amazon jungle. And he says that the jungle is, is not a beautiful place, but a place of suffering. And after being there so many times, I can understand what he was saying. He says that the birds don't sing. They, they cry for help instead of seeing. And once you're in the jungle, because like if you if you try to look at all the jungle, not the people, but the jungle, it looks beautiful. But it only looks beautiful in the picture. I bet you, if you're there, it's, 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 it's beautiful, but it's painful at the same time. The weather is harsh. This woman was walking with her daughter. They are from Ecuador. A Venezuelan guy offered them help. She was happy. So the Venezuelan guy took her daughter and put it on, on her shoulders, and they start walking. And suddenly the Venezuelan guy left and fall down. And the, the girl had a cut over her 
left eye. Do you remember I showed you the bracelets and told you that people had to pay? The same ideal group controlling migration is hiring doctors, putting doctors on these things. So they took the girl rather to the next position with doctors. It was, it was anesthetics and everything. And the doctors uh, put eight stitches on her face. This is Sara. Do you remember the girl? The guy was holding there. After uh, Sarah and Alexander, her mother, meeting back again at the end of the jungle, mm -hmm. they continued the journey in Central America. When they were crossing Costa Rica, President Biden announced that if they were migrants in Panama or in Mexico, they were not going to be able to apply for asylum. Instead of that, he was asking migrants to stay where they were and apply in an application called CBP-1. And through that, I am sponsor in the States and get legal access to the States. Once they were approved, they were going to be able to fly. Sara, uh, Alexandra, the mother, is a lawyer. So she understood what Biden was saying, and she stopped her journey. A family in the States start a campaign, collect some money, and apply with the documents for being sponsors of Sarah and Alexandra. They were stuck for more than a year without any answer from the American government. They were living in really complex conditions. Sarah was not attending school. There was nothing for food, for, for no, no food to eat. And they were waiting, waiting, waiting every day. After more than a year, they had no answer. They had to went back to Venezuela because they had no answer and they had no money. The mother was very worried about her daughter not going to school, not having no food, have no network to support her. So at the end, the family was not able to make it to the States. They were the only ones we knew that attend the call of the Biden, Joe Biden president. At the same time, it's the only ones who never made it. The families, the American families who were trying to support her at the end applied for asylum in Spain. And she was, she's now happy in Spain, but she was not able to see it in her dream to come to America. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this amazing and tragic story and for the work that you're doing and bringing it here to us. Um, I'm sure there's many people have questions. There might be a few online, but I think I'll let you just field questions as. Oh, um, so I'm really, and well, thank you first off for um, coming here and sharing all this with us. So, you know, you talk a lot about the treacherous journey. Um, so what was your experience like as a journalist trying to capture all this and also enduring many of these same conditions, right? And you've mentioned that you made this journey several times. So I was wondering if you could speak more about that. Yeah. I, I think it's very important uh, to point uh, as conditions, this idea of same conditions, because it's not, you know, like... I don't decide from one moment to the other. I'm going to die that just with my phone. You know, so that changes everything. I have like all the team from New York Times behind me. That's a very big team. I have months of preparation for things like this. Starting with physical preparation, food, emotional preparation. 
I have to start thinking, okay, I'm going to see people suffering. I'm going to see people on the worst moment. I'm going to see people dead. I'm going to maybe see people dying. How am I going to handle that? And I'm going, I'm preparing myself for that for months. I know that I can quit anytime I want. That's one of the most important. If I want to quit, I can call the Colombian army or the Panamanian army, or I can just call my boss of the New York Times and tell him I'm quitting, I'm going. I have a tracker with me, I have a sat phone on my pocket, I have Colombian cash, I have dollars because Panama works in dollars, I have my credit cards. In the worst scenario, I can find a helicopter that goes and picks me out and take me out. My family is in a safe place, and I know that no matter how the journey is, there are pretty good chances that I'm going back to my safe place. None of the people of the pictures have that. And that creates a huge difference. They don't have like the physical preparation, the emotional preparations, and the emotional security of all those conditions me and my partner have. So it wouldn't be fair to say that I experience, you know, that I cross the same jungle. Course. But the experience is quite different. My colleague, Julie Turkiewicz, um, she's a vegetarian, but also she she really she really knows like nutrition and things like that. And she prepares these special meals for us, for example. Uh, peanut butter sandwiches. And we ate one peanut butter sandwich for every day. Which is not a lot, it's gonna keep you alive. And we pack only one per day because that forced us not to share our food and not to eat more food than what we need. I have been walking the jungles since I was maybe three or four years old. You know, I'm Colombian, so I started going to jungles with my father. When I was seven, I asked my father to take me to the Amazon jungle. And I don't know how, but he did it. <laughs> so I'm used to this environment. Most of these families, let's talk only about the Venezuelan family. They are from Caracas, which is the capital city. They live in neighborhoods. They have never been in the jungle. They have never been in the wild. So being there is really complex. Think about this. 2,000 people walking the same path every day. What do you think happens? People have to pee and poo on that path. So guess what happens if you touch the water of the river? You know? All the trail smells like shit. It's horrible. The environmental damage is big. But I'm prepared for that. I know I can't drink that water, but there are many affluent affluents coming down to the main river. So if everybody's walking this way on the main river, I know that if I walk 10 minutes on an affluent, I can find fresh water I can drink. I came back and keep doing my journey. They don't know that. And also they're scared to lose, to get lost. I have a GPS with a map on my watch. They don't. So the difference that would, would be extremely unfair if I put myself in a situation of a mining cross in the jungle. And if I said I have experienced what these people have, have lived, and I know many journalists do that. But as more I walk the jungle with these people, as more I respect them and I try to understand from my privileged position, what they suffer. And I can't understand. I, I can't fully understand the suffering. I'm not going there with my kids or my wife or my mother. Mm. And I also not fleeing my country. I don't feel threatened in my country. I have a decent and somehow stable job in my freedom. 
Yes, you know, you know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah. Mm, so I think it's very important, not only for me, but for every journalist documenting a community to understand that standing in the same place doesn't mean feeling the same feelings. And it's just an approach, you know? Like, at the end, you just stay in the cover. Every, every, every people, everyone has a different story in a different portion that makes them be there. Mm -hmm. Of course, it helps me a lot being from Latin America. It helps me a lot because I have friends and families living in complex situations. I have friends and families, uh, and friends and relatives that have <laughs> very few money that can make it to the end of the month. So I can understand like how big is the difference? And I was talking to Howard, Howard, who was named for becoming an American. I was talking to Howard earlier. Um, and he's like, when you when you think about American middle class, and when you think about Latin American middle class, most of the, most of the people tend to think it's the same. It's not the same, it's far from the same, but far, I mean, far. Like, I don't know Latin American people who have savings and are middle class, starting from there. In the States, it's like, yeah, you're middle class, you have some savings, not there. So, yeah, like, talking about my personal experience, it's hard. But I would never put myself in a position that says I have lived and experienced what the migrants just wouldn't be fair. So you you uh you okay, thank you. So thank you very much for your for sharing with us your experiences and the photos and those uh, very important histories. And I would like to ask you, I would like I would ask something close to what she asked about how you deal emotionally and um how you connect to those people at the same time to keep yourself in a way that you could do this journey. I imagine it must be very, very difficult. I would like to ask you a question about um for women, because um you, to, uh, you talked about a, a woman, a Haitian woman with two kids that was kidnapped. So usually women they are with their families. Uh, I heard some stories about the coyotes and women in Mexican border, how they can suffer for uh, sexual violence. And, and if this is a question, so if there are something specific to, to, to women alone or in their, if their family are with family, if they protect them from uh, this kind of thing. Another thing is that do they know all the steps of the journey? You told that they don't know geographically, speaking what they're going to face, but for example, when you talked about their, the, the indigenous groups that was profiting $10 to sleep there, and then they arrive in Panama, they have to pay to go away. Do they know they have to spend this money? They, they would face all these things. And another question, I don't know if it's a specific one too, um, regarding this, this, all this money they have to, to spend with this, this journey, there is an organization, you said that there are criminal groups that organize like a little bit, but that's a very long journey. So I imagine that there are some contexts that change in which place and this whole journey, how long it takes. And I'll stop here. Because I have <laughs> Thank you so much. So the journey used to take from six to nine days before. Now it's taking about three to five days because they, have, they are changing the routes inside the jungle. They move the routes to go to one community or the other because the communities are profiting from mine. Yeah. And, and until the United States, like the ones that get until the border, it takes how long? The Central America and everything, do you know? So that varies a lot. Some people can make it in 15 days. Some people take three months because if you don't have the money, so basically, the system is not to carry money with you, but just a few. And then you made it to one place, and you call your relatives, and they wire you money, and you pay for the next day. And then you call your relatives, they send you money again, 
and you play for the next day. Because if you try to make the whole journey with the money in your pocket, it's, it's yeah. going to be stolen. It's not it can be stolen, it's going to be stolen for sure. Uh, can you give me a question no, one by one? I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll answer I'll, one by one. one. I'm sorry. How oh, about okay. women, women there? So, um, with that woman with her two daughters, most of the people I photograph, and maybe you can notice that in, in the pictures, it's like I, I don't use long lenses. And I, I don't use long lenses because using short lenses force me to be close to the people. You know, like I can't, I can just take pictures of you from here with a short lens. I need to come and be this close. So if I'm this close, what's going to happen is that I'm going to shake the hand, say my name. And at the same time, it's like, I guess you're a migrant crossing the barrier gap. And there's a guy with two cameras hanging from his neck. It's like, who are you? You know, I'm interested in them, but they are interested in me. Being close helps me create a bond. I gave my name, I asked your name, uh, I asked part of your story, uh, and you asked part of mine, and what are you doing here? Uh, I'm Federico, like, I'm a journalist. Uh, ah, okay, and who do you work for? Like, it's the New York Times. The New York Times? Does it have TikTok? <laughs> no. Can I find that on YouTube? No. So who do you work for? <laughs> it's, it's it's really interesting. It's really interesting because it helps me understand who am I talking to. It's like and who's uh, also helped me understand who's reading the New York Times. Most of my friends don't care about the New York Times. They don't even know what is the New York Times. But if you say to a migrant, uh, I'm a friend of Luisito Comunica, then all the doors are going to be open for you. Do you know who's Luisito Comunica? Okay, he's an influencer from Mexico, social media, and he poses as a journalist, but what's his name? But they do watch Luisito. Um, this woman with the doors, as part of the uh, short communication, sometimes long, is this is my name, this is my card, this is my phone number, do you have WhatsApp, do you have Facebook? Most of them use Facebook. And I prefer to stay in touch with these people through Facebook because even if they lost their phones, they're going to keep their Facebook accounts. So with that woman, I start messaging and she said that she was held in a different camp because she had no money to pay for, for anything else. And she was asking me for money. I don't get money because if you're a journalist and you get money to a subject, then you're transforming information into merchandise. You can do that. And uh, she was asking for money, asking for money, asking for money. And I was telling her, I cannot give you money. And after a week, she never answered back. So I guess she was kidnapped and she didn't make it, but I don't have any more news on her. And her Facebook account was frozen. Like she didn't post anything else, which is very uncommon. In a Venezuelan woman, not post something for a year. So yeah, you asked me about. Oh, that's it. Thank you. Uh, let you let me know. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you for everything you're sharing with us. And uh, I have questions. One I was really surprised by the fact that those gangs or groups who organize the passing through a given territory, but they have doctors. What is that? Are they competing with each other and then whoever is providing the best? No, 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 no. Is... Okay, so those... That, that's one. And the other one is, I was waiting for you to say the word uh, narcotraffic traffic and gangs and violence as a reason or a key element in this whole thing, and you never mention it. Um, it They're just not players in this whole thing. Mm, let me go again with the Colombian map. So this is Europe at Golf, next clip, and I can be. This is what they cross. And this is one big atrato. 
trigger. This group I'm talking about controls the whole region. And it's just one group. It's called the um, Clan del Golfo, the name of the group. They profit from migration, narco traffic. They extort big companies and they also profit from gold mining. Those are like the four ways of income from the group, for the group, sorry. But migration and the other activities, it's really hard to establish a relation. There are some people, and there are some journalists, claiming that migrants crossing the Daringa are hiding drugs and moving drugs on their backpacks for, for these people. I have to say, as a journalist, first, I have never seen something like that myself, so I can prove it. And second, I have been documenting narco traffic for a long time and wouldn't be efficient to ask a migrant to move a load of cocaine because anything can happen. And it's just a lot of money. So if you're a criminal organization in control of all these and you're moving drugs, asking people you don't know and you don't trust to move the drug, which is like uh, really expensive, is just not effective. So I, I, I don't think it's happening and I haven't seen it. So as a journalist, I can't prove that. I will stay away from that. And what about your the doctors? I, I, ah, the doctors. They competing yeah. competing with each other? So, no, they are not competing with each other. It's the same group. It's the same one group. And the thing is, migrants fall and have like broken food or broken knee or they cut themselves uh, or they have diarrhea and fever, uh, tropical diseases, everything. It's like lots of things happen in the jungle. In order to make the flow more efficient, they put three stations with doctors, not one, but three on different places of the route, all in the Colombian side, because they just control the Colombian side. Because if they have somebody who is sick or wounded, that's going to delay a lot of people. But if they have a doctor, the wounded and his small Finally, is going to, are going to the doctor, and the rest of the people, the rest of the flow is moving. So basically, they are investing in keeping the flow because that's giving them money. Thank you. Luz? My question is more of how you get to the process that you get in and you're able to do your job because you're talking about groups, organized groups. So how do you get, one, the trust? Because I went to Panama and one of their indigenous group, they had to trust you to let you into yeah. the community. So how did you keep that trust? Even today that you're speaking to us and you're talking about all the issues, how do you manage that? So earning trust is part of my job and uh, learning how to do that the fastest is like a skill you get for years. But basically, you need to go there to the entrance point, not willing to cross, but willing to talk to people and understand who are the key players and what do they need to trust you. Uh, also, I was very clear from the beginning with them that I was focusing on migration, not them. And they are there. They just, there's a moment when they, they just stop caring about you. So yeah, I think that that's an important part of my job, going there and showing them I'm interested in migration, not in the, the army group. And my second part will be, I see the crossing and the need and people suffering, but at the same time, I was in my head, I'm thinking of violence, like if there's violence against women, uh, fights, uh, because people are in, in need, food, yeah. hunger, is that happen a lot to me? Because you see from the photos of suffering, but then you wonder what happens within the groups. There's a lot of violence. There is, there is a lot of violence against women. There is uh, 
dramatic numbers of women sexually assaulted and raped. The problem is while you're crossing the mountains, while you're crossing the Daringa, the, there is no authority that you can't talk to anybody. Second, as I told you, there are no numbers of people coming out of Colombia. So you can compare numbers of people going out and people coming in to know how many people died or got lost in the jungle. So you just have the number of people that arrive. But that's only the success number. And third, this is the highest, the, the biggest problem. Once the migrant made it to Panama, there's like Doctors Without Borders, International Red Cross, United Nations, UNICEF. But the migrants itself, the migrants themselves, they know that if they go, in, if they go to the authorities and they complain about being raped, assaulted, extorted, kidnapped, whatever, in the jungle, that only means their journey is going to be delayed. And their goal is to make it. So I think it's important to understand that in our society, when, you, when we have a stable place, it's easy to claim for justice. It's easy to, to, to seek for justice. You know? If any of you have a situation, you go to the police, you go to the authorities, whoever it is, and tell your story and you start and, and you're expecting for justice. But they know that if they stop in Panama, expecting for justice, that's going to play their trip. One, two, three weeks or months. And what's gonna happen? If your aggressor was a migrant, are the authorities going to call him? If it was an indigenous guy. Are they going to find him? If he was a guy with a mask, like you even you don't even know who is your aggressor. And what you can say is, I had this situation where I don't know, three days walking back in the jungle. Who's going to do something about it? Nobody. So it's really sad and complex, but the numbers of victims uh, claiming for justice are very low. And all the authorities and journalists know that's an undercount because basically people is not talking about it because they just want to keep going and make mistakes. I think the third question than before, but um, so there are lots of things I could ask you, and I appreciated your first response because um, I've been in a different situation where have been felt very privileged to be learning from somebody has been through not the situations quite big, uh, whatever. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, and I feel like we have a lot to learn from people who go through these journeys. And I see some students in the room. I um I work in downstairs on the first floor and a lot of students who come there and part of this um Every year, that we have a different year of something, this year is the year of discourse and dialogue. And so that we receive funding for that, um, from the university for that. And are so glad to have this event. It's just a part of it, just a conversation about so many complicated things happening in the world. Um, but I wonder what you might have to say, any wisdom about what we, not only students, but especially students, and you were just talking about justice, for instance, but I imagine that's a very complicated thing, but what might we glean from those you've observed and witnessed and gained trust from through are on these journeys that may be really powerful and important for us to know that may not be in the media per se, or just your day-to-day -day experiences being alongside them. Um, that we might learn from them about something that is just um, maybe they would want us to know, if that makes sense. What I have learned from from talking to these people while walk, while walking with them in the jungle is <laughs> most of them are desperate <laughs> back home, and they ran out of options. They tried. And they just ran out of options. Luis Miguel, the guy, sit down with the daughter next to him. 
he fled Venezuela, he went to Colombia, he tried to be a cab driver. He was not making it enough money to feed his family at the end of the month. Just to feed his family. Uh, Hamlet, the father of the three daughters whose wife died of breast cancer in Venezuela, he can't put two of his daughters in school. And the third one was waiting at home because he was not able to, to afford school for the three of them. And he was working hard in Peru. Mm, I have a personal story with my bridge. There was, a, there was a man, his name is Jesus. He's a Venezuelan guy. And he helps me in my house with lots of things. You know, if, I, if I need to do a fence, I hire Jesus. And there's a lot of people in my neighborhood that, that hires him. He, he has the trust of all the community. He's a hard working man and he do a great job. If I need to fix anything on my house and I can't handle it myself, and I hire Jesus, he can't, he do everything. And three months ago, he came to me like, hey, Pedro, you know what? I have seen you have been in the Darien Garden. I, I want to go there. Like, my personal like not, not journalists but like like human reaction was no 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 man you're crazy like like everybody loves you here you have a job everybody's hiring you you have so much jobs to do that if i call you to do to do something you can't come the next day i have to wait for you two or three weeks that means you you are demanded you know you, you you're full of work and then he told me how much he was earning a month. And then he told me he had spoken with a friend in the States who was making $1,000. And I was like, I ran out of words. You know? So it's like, it's, it's that complex. Most of them also come here to work. They have a the idea of come here, work hard, find a place to live with their families, a way to feed their families, mostly school for their kids. That means that, that means a future for their kids. Uh, according to the OCTE, maybe you know what's OCTE? Like uh, OCDE. It's a uh, Observatory para el Desarrollo Mundial. OECD. 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 And do you know what it means? Yeah, it's the like the economic organization. For yeah. Cooperation. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. According to these people, OECD, for an American family, it takes one generation to go from one place in the economic scale to the next one. In Europe, it's almost the same, but in some places of Europe, you can climb up to two places in one generation. That means your your like your family, once they grown up, are going to be like two steps above you in the economic uh, scale of society. In places like Colombia, it takes eleven generations to climb one step. That means if you're poor, your sons, your grandsons, and nine generations more are condemned to be poor. They don't even measure Venezuela. So when you understand that, it's, it's so hard to try to tell people, don't come, don't come. Luis Miguel, again, the guy seated next to her daughter. He came, he entered, he finally got permit to work. Within a year, he was able to buy the first car of his life, an old used SUV. He sent me the video of his kids finding the car parked in front of their house. The happiness of that family, starting from the happiness of the father. Can you imagine being a grown man, working hard and buying your first car? And then can you imagine the happiness you feel when you see your kids running through that car? So, yeah, I think, I think that what I have seen is people willing to work. Mm -hmm. 
I don't see, and I would say if I find something like that, but I don't see people thinking or telling me, yeah, I'm trying to go to states to beg for money in the streets. I don't see that. I don't see that. That's not the kind of Latin American people I have met. Thank you. So, Martin, if, if I retract to a more crass sort of question, but in terms of budget, like how much money does it take about to make that journey all the way to the US? In other words, how much money do the families have to put together so that one person can cross the yeah. border? Okay, that's so complex. That's so complex. Because, again, when people like you, are going to make a trip. We have a budget. Yeah, we think that kind. Of, yeah, so there are two things we we usually do when we're trying to plan a trip. Yeah, we think about a map, about a budget, and that's how you decide where to go. These people don't. They don't care about the map because they are on their route. If it takes them a month or a year. You don't care. They just don't care. They are following up. And about budget, the problem is they exit in Panama, and if they don't have enough money, they do whatever it takes. And if that means begging in the streets, they go begging in the streets. But it's complex to set like the money. Across the Daringa, from here. This is eighty dollars the boat, and eighty more dollars for the stamp. That's one hundred and sixty, and three hundred and seventy dollars for the for the bracelets across. That's about five hundred and fifty. And then sixty more in Panama to go to Costa Rica, and sixty more in Costa Rica to go to Guatemala. And then you're alone in the streets. But if you think about food hydration. No, I think it's really complex to make a number. We have more accurate numbers from people from Africa because they are not like doing anything on the road, but they, they have the money, not on their pockets, but loans from people who already made it. Most of the people who made it start sending people to their old friends and neighborhoods so they can make it because they know that once the mind and the right, they're going to start working and paying the loan. So if people from Afghanistan and Africa is between 11,000 to 15,000, it's very expensive. You can make it. You know? I mean, these people understand that they can make like $500 a month to save. That means Within a year or two, they can pay the, pay the loan. To make that money in their home country would be impossible. And the only reason why I asked was because, you know, there are people who are using other means to cross in, to, to cut out the dead end, who yeah. are landing in the middle of Central America yeah. because of the human time and economic. And yeah. The Africans, for example, most of the Africans like, fly to Turkey, and from Turkey they fly to Bogota in Colombia. We published an article about that yep. this so morning in the New York Times. From Bogota, they have to fly to El Salvador. Suddenly, El Salvador, since last year, is charging $1,130 a person just for landing and taking off again. Just if you're African. If you're Latin American, they don't charge. But if you're African, and it's like, yeah, profiting from profit, profiting from the most poor people in the world, like living in a desperate condition. They land in Nicaragua. Of course, you know a lot of Nicaragua. The Ortega regime don't care about what the state says about migration. They just let people land and continue by land. And you're familiar with the confidential finding from last year, right? They're pro actually profiting per yeah. person government. What is it? 
Confidential is a Nicaraguan newspaper that after research, they find that the Nicaraguan government is also profiting from migrants, asking them for money to continue their journey for the country. They're actually chartering flights from Haiti to land in Nicaragua, 20 to 30 flights a day sometimes, so that people can have an express route to the US through Nicaragua. In Colombia territory, it seems like the Plano Loso has a lot on on this movement of people profiting from it and helping it flow. Um, on the Panama side, um, it seems more organized. Indigenous communities, other people who live there who are availing themselves of an opportunity for enrichment that's fallen into their laps. So indigenous communities are profiting, of course. Uh, because once the migrant flow arrives to their communities, they sell food, they sell water, sodas, and they they ask themselves, do you remember the picture of the people locked in a, in a, in a fence? They ask for, for money to exit that fence. Um, it's really complex in this context. These communities have been isolated for centuries. The Kuna community, are several days walking from the next uh, hospital or police station or road. So they argue they are profiting from, from people crossing their territory because that's their ancestral territory. Mm. I think that would be a conversation much more appropriate for the sociology that have studied the phenomenon. Uh, as a journalist, all I can say is that yes, that people is profiting from from migrants. If that's something I can prove. Um, but once they exit the jungle, they go into these camps, and the Panamanian government, with the Panamanian authorities, are putting these people in buses, charging sixty dollars a person, and that's it. So this is in the south of Panama. Panama City is in the middle of the country. And the buses don't stop there. The buses go straight to the north and let these people go to the We're going to cut it off. Well, one more question, but we never go more than an hour and a half. But I don't want to cut it off because it's been so fast. And listen to it. One, six, one last. Um, I was just wondering how you balance like your own humanitarian interests with also like keeping your journalistic integrity, and how do you wrestle with that like in, in your own mind? I think it's not it's not as complex as, as it looks like. Mm -hmm. Because as a journalist, I do this every day. That means I face the same the same dilemma every single day of my life. Not only when I'm working with, when I'm working with migrants. Um so with the time it's not it's not becoming easier, but you you you're finding like uh like shortcuts in your head and easy, easy answers for you. It's, it's, it's not easy to see people people suffering. If I see, like, the, do you remember the picture of the Chinese woman? Like, she's 13 years old. Her father was desperate behind her. They were all talking to us in Chinese. And, of course, I don't understand any of Chinese, and they were not speaking English. And the young woman was vomiting in the floor. She was not able to move. Mm. So I think I, I, I have to think immediately. I'm a I'm a believer in journalism. If I change the situation in front of me, that changed the story. And I can't be part of the story. There's a line, of course. That's the line. Like I don't change the cause of the story because. If I do it, then I can't document it. If I see somebody dying in front of my camera, I'm gonna drop my camera and try to help. If I if I think I, there's a way to help. Um, but if you go to uh firefighters, if you go to police corps and military corps or first responders, you're going to learn that unless 
those way to help and came out from there safely, you don't go there. There's no way to came out safe, you don't go there. Okay. If somebody somebody's drowning and you're alive safe and you know how to go rescue the guy and came back, that's what you do. Okay. If you don't know how to do that, you don't. So I had that clear in my head. And being in the daring gap, like a, that's that's how that's why we pack the way we pack. That's why we bring like one sandwich a day. Uh, and the last day, I told Julie, my partner, uh, if we find somebody who was like really, really starving, and I told her, I'm going to give him my sandwich. She was like, no, you can't. I'm going to give him my sandwich. It's like, I know what, what are you going to eat? I'm going to find food tonight. Look at the map. It's like, because I know that, that we are arriving that night. Mm -hmm. And that was the only sandwich I was able to share. If I shared the sandwich from the day before, I would be starving the jungle. So I think it's important to prepare for that. It's important to, to, yeah, to have mental preparation for that. And I think it's important to understand, to like think about the brain as if it was a muscle. Think about a professional sport player, soccer player, or whatever sport you want. If all of us try to play a soccer match, I don't think that we're going to make it to the end of the game. We will be exhausted on the floor, heart attacks, cramps, broken legs and arms, everything, you know? But a sports professional can handle that easily, you know, every weekend. That's it. I have to prepare my brain that way, you know, before, during, and after. And I know I can, I, and I, I know I can do it, but I know after coming out of the jungle, I need to go and have professional, gotta take professional care of my emotions. Because I, if I don't, it's just like a professional sport player that goes and plays the sports and takes out and do nothing. Because after a sport player plays, he came in, he stretches, he has massages, he has like special foods, special uh, hydration, you know, like there's a lot of, there's a whole protocol to take care of his body. I have to go to a whole protocol to take care of my emotional situation because I'm not, I'm not like a emotional bulletproof. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, it, like nobody is, nobody is like, it like, would be, would be alive to say like, no, that, that, that does not affect me. So of course it affects me. You develop some skills. Uh, Julie, my partner, she has a, a complex situation and is, she asks the most basic questions to people, even the most basic questions to people, and people start crying in front of her immediately. So I go like, hey, hello, how are you? I'm Federico, I'm a journalist. I'm going to take some pictures of you. Ah, yeah, okay, okay, no problem. Julie came and said, hey, I'm Julie Turkiewicz, I'm the journalist, I'm writing the story, how are you? And the people start crying. Immediately. And she knows that crying in front of that people is not helping. Mm -hmm. So she tries to comfort, but also she holds her herself. And I do the same. I have two kids, eight and ten, Guess what's happening in my heart when I see the kids in the jungle? Yeah? Mm -hmm. But I know how to hold myself. And after I exit the jungle, I go and release all that emotions and I yeah, take care of my mental health. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important. I think that's one of the like that's one of the hiding sides of journalism at large. People don't talk about that. People don't. People try not to face that situation. And people try to think, no, I came out of the jungle. And I'm okay, you know, I feel okay. Let's go for, let's go to a bar. Ah. <laughs> and you start noticing some behaviors and some things. But yeah, it's like you go to Ukraine, you see the war, you see dead people. <laughs> That's not normal. 
You need to take care of your emotions. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. I have one question. Where's your work uh, with photographs and the stories? Are, are those published in the, in the website or somewhere? In the New York Times, yes. I'm <laughs> Times. I wrote late, but no, no, that's okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, please join me in thanking you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bruce, for inviting me.